My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Julie Lalonde. We are in a period of almost unprecedented mainstream discussion of gendered harassment and violence. Even before the new, and perhaps still fragile, space opened by the Me Too movement for at least some women to name their abusers, feminists in Canada had been building on the media firestorm in the wake of numerous women sharing their experiences with former CBC radio personality Gian Gomeshi to create space for a relatively sophisticated and sustained public conversation about gendered power and about the violence that mostly men do to mostly women and trans people. And yet, for all of that attention and for all of that sophistication, today's guest argues that we have still had relatively little opportunity to talk about one specific manifestation of this sort of violence that is much more common than many people realize. And that is stalking. Stalking captures a range of behaviors in which someone surveils, repeatedly contacts, and often intimidates or threatens someone else. In Canada, this behavior gets read into the legal category of criminal harassment, though as with so many other kinds of gendered violence, legal mechanisms do not have a great track record of keeping people safe. Though stalking can occur in many different contexts, most often it is done by men and targets women, who are most often former partners. Julie Lalonde is a longtime women's rights advocate and public educator whose work focuses on ending sexual violence in Canada. And two years ago, when a man she had been in a relationship with for a couple of years more than a decade before unexpectedly passed away, she was finally able to reveal that he had been stalking her that entire time. Her abuser surveilled and harassed her both online and offline. He followed her, he threatened her, he filled her life with fear. Her attempt to use the peace bond process to get the legal system to protect her was a disaster. She felt unable to tell even many people close to her about what was going on. And she found that even in the context of the feminist anti-violence movement, there really wasn't a lot of space to talk about stalking, nor many resources to help her deal with it. Now, along with the difficult personal journey of healing from the trauma, she has decided to put that lived experience to work in her professional and political activities. Partly, that means incorporating discussions of stalking, including her own experience, more fully into her public education work, which is receiving lots of positive feedback from women that attend her events who have had similar experiences. She also began a new project specifically focused on stalking called Outside of the Shadows. The initial phase of Outside of the Shadows is a short animated film that you can find on YouTube. Julie tells the story of her own experience and offers practical tips both for people who are being stalked and for those who love and support them. It was funded by 87 individual donations and was animated by Montreal artist Ambivalently Yours. In light of the very positive responses that the video has received, Julie has a number of next steps in mind. She and Ambivalently Yours are working on having the movie translated, producing shorter video clips about specific aspects of the topic, and making posters. They also intend to jointly do a workshop that combines their respective skills to provide a way for victims and survivors to process their experiences through art. And Julie is committed to opening up conversations about the root causes of stalking, from the elements of dominant masculinity that contribute to it, to the ways that romantic comedies often normalize and even romanticize stalking behaviors, and much more. Ultimately, she dreams of founding an organization devoted to promoting the social, political, and legislative changes necessary to end stalking. I speak with Julie about her own experiences and about her work on the Outside of the Shadows project. My name is Julie Athlone. 
I'm an Ottawa-based women's rights advocate and public educator who works with various organizations dedicated to ending sexual violence in Canada. And I'm also a survivor of stalking and intimate partner violence. Uh, about two years ago, my abuser died very suddenly. And so I came out about my story and have spent the last couple years really trying to advocate for the voices of women who've been stalked. Last summer, I channeled my frustration at the silence into a project called Outside of the Shadows, which is a project on criminal harassment in Canada. I partnered with the incredible Montreal-based artist Ambivalently Yours to create a five-minute short film that's free and available on YouTube that explores what stalking looks like and gives both the survivors and their allies tips on how to keep each other as safe as possible. I come from very working-class, poor roots in Northern Ontario. And so when I went to Ottawa to get an education, it was very clear, at least set out for me by my family, that I had a responsibility to not just get a piece of paper, but to do something meaningful with it. So I made it an important part of my education to volunteer, to get involved. And that's how I really started doing work in the anti-violence movement. I was a mentor with young girls through Big Sister. I volunteered at a sexual assault center I fought for several years to create a sexual assault center at Carleton University, and I started gaining a reputation as someone who was willing to speak out on issues. And what's interesting now for me is that people saw me as very fearless, and in fact, I was the very opposite because I was very quietly, silently, privately dealing with a stalking ex-partner. Most people use the term stalking, but under the criminal code, it's referred to as criminal harassment. And it's everything from repeated unwanted contact, acts that are threatening or intimidating, surveillance, so threatening to watch somebody or watching somebody. The legal system is quite slow when it comes to taking on online technology, but technically it does include online surveillance, although of course it's much more difficult to prove. My experience checked off every box. He sent me threatening notes to my home, left them on my car, sent them to my work. He followed me to and from class. I had to move several times. At one point, he moved into the apartment behind mine so that he could watch me at all times. He got his friends to monitor my behavior. He found out, because we come from the same small town, that I would had a death in the family, and he stalked me to the Greyhound station and threatened to kill me. He sent me dead flowers. He would write these lengthy suicide notes telling me he was going to kill himself and it would be all my fault online, you know, whatever you could think of, he did. He would create various social media accounts to follow me. If I created new emails, he would find them right away. Because I have a public profile, I'm in the news fairly often. So he would monitor whenever I was in the news and use that as an excuse to contact me. And this went on for over a decade. One of the things that's kind of ironic is that you can't actually have post-traumatic stress disorder until the behavior has stopped. So I was living in survival mode for over a decade. He dies. I come out with my story. And in fact, that's when I started feeling quite terrible because everything had caught up with me. So I do have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I spend a lot of time and money working to heal from that. Also, I started dating him when I was 18. I left him around the time I was 20 and he died shortly around my 30th birthday. So this is somebody who stalks me for my entire adulthood. And your 20s is the time in which, as a society, we allow you to take risks, make mistakes, date, party, travel, explore who you are as a person, find yourself. And I did none of those things because I was living in fear all the time. And when you have been made to believe, and I do believe it was in fact the case, that my life was at risk, you don't plan ahead. You don't make plans for 10 years down the road or even five years down the road because in your mind, you're not going to be here. And so it really took away this opportunity that I should have been given, like so many others, to take risks and, you know, yeah, backpack through Europe or, you know, just go to the bars until two in the morning and go home with someone that you thought was cute at the bar. Like all of these things. I went to school. I went to work. I volunteered. I came home. That was my life for those entire years. When you're making every decision from a fear-based standpoint, you're, of course, censoring yourself and limiting your freedom of mobility. More than that, though, it was the idea that if I didn't stay busy, I would fall apart. And so I just would say, okay, well, let's take on another project or let's do another degree. Or That was my world for over a decade. Around 20,000 people a year report criminal harassment. It's very gendered. 
76% of the folks who experience criminal harassment are women, and over 50% of them are women who are stalked by a former partner. Men absolutely experience stalking, but like sexual violence, most men are stalked by other men, and men are stalked by women, absolutely, but the very nature of stalking is gendered. It's mostly women who are stalked by mostly men. And in many cases, men that they had a relationship with prior to the stalking commencing. How did you go about turning your experience of stalking into the Outside of the Shadows project? I came out with my story in the summer, fall of 2015. Because I had a bit of a profile already, I was approached to write my piece for Flair magazine. They gave me lots of freedom to write a very lengthy piece about my story. I wrote a piece for The Globe and thought, okay, this is me sparking a discussion. And it was lots of people talking to me about their experience, but I didn't see much pickup from the feminist movement. I didn't see much pickup politically. I approached some political folks to do some legislative changes that I want to see around stalking. That didn't really lead to anything. I was approached to write a film, to be in a documentary. I was approached to write a book. And none of those things went through. They all fell through in large part because they were like, this is a crazy story, but I don't think it's that common. And we're already talking so much about violence against women. Because remember, this was at the height of Gomeshi when I was telling my story. So then I just got really frustrated because I said, I know I'm not alone. I hear from women all the time. But the nature of stalking is that talking about it makes it worse. Unless your abuser is dead or in jail, you can't talk about your experience. And so if we're waiting for a Me Too moment around stalking, it's never going to happen. So I decided to basically say, if no one else is going to create these resources, then I guess I got to do it myself. So I pled with my social media followers, with my family, with my friends, my social network to say, I want to create a resource and I need money. So if you trust me to do the right thing, please donate to me. I contacted Montreal-based artist Ambivalent Yours, who is an incredible visual artist whose work really centers around women's experiences of trauma and pain. And I said, do you do animation? And she's like, well, not really, but I could. And I said, okay, how much money do you need? And then I went and raised that money. The goal was to make a five-minute film that would be readily available so anybody could access it, put it up on YouTube. And then the response has been overwhelming. So why has the feminist anti-violence movement not had space to talk about stalking? The feminist anti-violence movement has been siloed into two categories, and that's because of how we're funded. So you have the shelter movement that focuses on intimate partner violence, and then you have sexual assault centers that focus on sexual assault. Stalking for women falls between the two. So as I said, the vast majority of women are stalked by a former partner, so that would fall within the domestic violence category. But stalking feels like the threat of rape hanging over your head. And the idea of surveillance is such a huge part of rape culture, the idea that you're being watched all the time, that you have to be conscientious of how you're dressed, of how you're walking, whether or not it's late at night, like all of those pieces, that's part of rape culture. And so sexual violence and domestic violence overlap in and of itself. But in the case of stalking, it's a combination of those two factors. And because of that, well, whose job is it to talk about these issues? And then you layer on the fact that most social justice movements, whether you're talking about Black Lives Matter or you're talking about Me Too, are born from people breaking the silence about their individual stories of trauma and pain. And that can't happen by definition with stalking. So it's like, okay, someone has to pick up this hot potato, but who's going to take the leadership on it? And so it just doesn't get addressed. The shelter movement in Canada does incredible work with women who come into their shelter to make sure that they're kept safe. But in terms of the public advocacy, in terms of the public conversation, nobody has taken up responsibility for it. And it's a result of the way in which these organizations are funded and the mandates that they have. Why did you decide to go with a short animated film versus all of the other media that you might have chosen? I wanted to elicit feelings. I wanted people to understand what stalking does to you as a person, and I wanted them to have a gut visceral reaction and not just a cognitive one. 
And so the best way to do that, in my experience, is through art and through sort of visual means. And instead of creating, you know, a blog post that many people wouldn't read or a series of infographics and memes that maybe people would look at one or two, but they wouldn't see them as a package, I thought it was important to create a film that really told you a story and carried you through that story so that you would not only understand what stalking is on a practical level, but what it does to you as a human being. And then once I've got you, okay, I'm compelled by this person's experience, then let's transition into tools to keep each other safe. I talk about what I went through and then how I'm dealing now. I mean, I'm very honest and quite frankly, pretty vulnerable in the film in terms of talking about my post-traumatic stress disorder, about how it's changed who I am as a person, the impact that it's had on me. And then I give bystanders practical tools. So your friend is being stalked. Here's some things that are really helpful for you to keep in mind. And then I end with giving a number of practical tips for victims and survivors. When I sat down to write the script for the film, I really thought, okay, what are practical things that I wish someone had told me so that I could have had this given to me instead of me just trying to figure it out on my own? Talk about some of those practical tips for people who are experiencing stalking. If you can afford to, it's always important to send your mail to a P.O. box. People having access to your mail means that they can easily commit identity fraud, that they can also just intercept your world and make your life much more difficult. If you live together and you can't move, ask your landlord to change the locks. If you trust your neighbors or the people on your floor, just letting them know, hey, I don't know if you remember so-and-so, but you know, this is what's going on. Please don't let them into the building. Deactivating the GPS on your phones is really important. Having GPS enabled on your phone is a really easy way for someone to track where you're going and where you've been. Same thing with geotagging yourself online. So don't tag yourself, geotag yourself in photos. Try to put all of your social media on lockdown. And if you do need a public profile for work purposes, really monitor the kinds of things that you post to make sure that that person can't track, you know, oh, it seems like she goes to this coffee shop a lot. And then they can start going there to monitor you. The most important one is to just be honest about your pain with the people that you trust. Find one or two people in your life that you trust intimately and have them be your sounding board. Have them be the people where you can be honest about what you're going through. I didn't have a lot of that. I thought, I'm just worrying my friends and family. I'm just stressing them out. And I mean, to their credit, it's really hard to be friends with someone who stalked for over a decade. So of course, these people got exhausted. But the end result was that I had so few outlets to talk about what I was going through and to process and to vent and to get angry. And that made healing much more difficult. And if those people are concerned about you, take them seriously. If you feel like the violence is escalating and the cops aren't taking you seriously, then absolutely trust your gut. That's a huge part of this. And document everything and anything. That's my number one piece of advice for victims and survivors is document dates and times of phone calls, dates and times of social media messages, screen grab everything. If an incident happens and there's people around, write down the date, time, location, and who the people were that were standing around in case you later on need proof and you need witnesses. You have to collect as much evidence as you can. And what advice do you have for friends and loved ones of someone who's being stalked? First thing is understand the cycle of abuse. So many people in my life did not understand why I had conflicted feelings about him, especially in the early days when it was very volatile and I was literally moved from place to place. And then he would sucker me into talking to him again. And I thought, okay, well, maybe if I'm just nice to him, then maybe he'll calm down. And the people around me being like, what's wrong with you? You should be smarter than this. You're a women's studies student and you're falling for his crap. You know, family members saying, you were not raised to tolerate this kind of behavior. What's wrong with you? Where's your head at? That just added to the shame and humiliation. And it reinforced all the horrible things that he said to me when we were together. You don't want to be one more person kicking somebody while they're down. You're allowed to be frustrated that you see an intelligent person making what you think are dumb decisions. But it's not your place to put that on them. Because every time someone said that to me, I just thought, okay, then I can't tell them what I'm going through because I'm a disappointment to them. And so it just added to chipping away at the very little self-esteem I had left. And the second thing is to check in. 
we are reticent to talk about our experiences because as I said, we don't want to burden other people. We don't want to scare other people. We don't want to worry them. So just checking in and being like, hey, no pressure if you don't want to talk about it, but just want to say that like, I know you're going through something that's really scary and I'm here for you. If you don't want to talk about it, that's okay too. And like, you can be honest with me about how scary it is and I'm not going to abandon you. That is a life-saving piece of advice to give to someone and to trust your gut as well. If you see that the violence is escalating and they don't, be honest with them and saying, I'm really afraid for your safety. Just stay at my house for one night. It'll make me feel better. Be honest with people about what you're seeing and observing because they're in the eye of the storm and they maybe can't see it from the same perspective that you can. What kinds of collective changes would you like to see from the grassroots level on up to changes in legislation to deal with this issue? We are having unprecedented levels of conversation on violence against women in this country, and we have since Gomeshi. So it's been a sustained conversation for close to four years. So you need to include stalking and criminal harassment in those conversations. I think we have a responsibility as social justice-minded individuals, as organizations, as movement builders, to say, hey, we're talking about domestic violence, we're talking about dating violence, we're talking about rape culture, we're talking about workplace harassment. Why aren't we talking about stalking? There's nothing stopping us from talking about it. From a legislative standpoint, the peace bond process nearly killed me, and it is an easy fix. In my case, and the case of many people who would be in a similar situation, I fought to get a peace bond, which most people know as sort of a version of a restraining order. I was not informed of the fact that I had to go and literally put my hand in front of a Bible and testify into a recorder that what I was saying was true, and that he would get 10 days notice to appear in court. Also, that he would be entitled to legal aid and I wasn't because he was the one who was being charged, so to speak, and I wasn't. For 10 days when he was served at work, so that's a humiliating process, which is a trigger for him. For 10 days, he mounted a campaign of incredible intimidation and fear to try to get me to back down. And then the day of the actual trial, you have to actually show up and stand beside this person and testify in front of a panel of judges that you are, in fact, living in fear and this person should absolutely have to stay away from you. That day, he showed up at my house and said, get in the car. You're going to go there and you're going to tell them that you retract your statement. And if you don't, you're not coming home. So I did. I went there and I retracted my statement and I was absolutely berated by a panel of judges. Instead of asking me why I decided to back down and creating an opportunity for me to say, because he's going to kill me in the parking lot, they instead berated me in front of a full packed courthouse about how I'm the reason why women get abused because I obviously lied about this for attention and you showed up here with him. So you obviously aren't afraid of him. Why are you wasting the court's time? And then we left. That process was horrendous. And that's an easy fix. If I go to get a peace bond, it should be put in place right away so that if he tries to contact me, he's considered in violation of a peace bond. And so then if someone is putting a peace bond against someone else maliciously, then that person can just wait the 10 days, show up at the courtroom and say, she's saying that I did this to her, but it's actually because I fired her and she's upset. So this peace bond process is bogus. And then the judges will take that into consideration and it won't be in place anymore. But currently, giving someone 10 days notice to appear in court and no restrictions on what they do in those 10 days puts women's lives at risk. And that is a moment in which my life went left instead of right. Had I been able to go through with that peace bond, it would have stopped. But there were not protections put in place for me. And that's a legislative change that is not difficult to make. In this moment, what else about gendered violence is not reaching the mainstream conversation? I'm really invested in root causes. I think we need to have conversations with young men in particular around entitlement, for sure, but things like vulnerability. As a young man, he was a young white man crying at the doorstep of his ex-girlfriend, and that suckered people in. People saw his vulnerability as bravery, and they saw it as some big grand gesture that he was willing to be that vulnerable in a public space. That needs to change. If men had access to vulnerability in various times and spaces in their lives, then we would recognize when it's appropriate to be sad that someone left you and when it's dangerous and manipulative to be sad that someone left you. So things like the friend zone, right? There's really a sense of like, I was nice to you and you didn't even have sex with me. Like I'm owed something. We need to talk about that. Like those are the pieces that enable this kind of behavior. Fundamentally, it's the sense of entitlement. It's the sense that you owe me something because I did something for you, or I'm a nice guy, so why are you being this way to me? All of those pieces, 
we absolutely need to have those conversations with young men. And then we need to follow through and talk about what does accountability look like? We need to talk about what we want from abusive men. We, of course, want them to stop, but is an apology enough? Because we have, I think, rightfully criticized the various apologies that we have seen in the public sphere over the last few months. So I get it that these apologies are shallow and hollow and mean nothing. But then what do we want from abusive men, especially as progressive social justice minded people who are very critical of the prison industrial complex, who are very aware of the fact that prison is not a space of rehabilitation? Then what do we want instead? I don't have an answer. I think there's multiple answers, but I think we need to have that conversation in the mainstream, but also within our own organizations. What does it mean when we have an abuser that's part of the feminist movement? What do we do when someone is committing alcohol facilitated sexual assault at our parties in the punk scene or at our parties within the union movement? Like, what do we do with these guys? I don't have an answer, but I would really like for us to keep having that conversation. Where do you see this project headed? We have a goal to get some workshops off the ground where I would be facilitating in terms of the content of talking about my experience, talking about trauma, talking about why I found art so helpful in terms of channeling that. And then I'm definitely yours would be doing the art-based piece, so showing people how to draw and how to make art. And so we have this vision of a workshop that would be kind of traditionally seen as like art-based therapy And then in terms of content, I really want to do a piece around root causes. I want to talk about things like romantic comedies, wanting to create something that talks about the ways in which we teach people what romance is and how that can be really dangerous. And also creating the 101, whether it's a short clip or maybe some posters that just talk about what constitutes criminal harassment in plain language and not just legalese. But my dream is to create an organization. We don't have a single organization in Canada whose sole mandate is to talk about criminal harassment. And I would love to do that. I would love to see that happen so that people could have kind of a one-stop shop in terms of getting access to information around their legal rights, a hub whose sole mandate would be to advocate for victims and survivors and their families, and then who also work around that prevention piece. But then also those other pieces around how do you keep yourself safe outside of the legal system? How do you take care of yourself? How do you have conversations with your kids in order to prevent this stuff from happening? And just that validation piece, to create an organization just on principle to say, there's a group in Canada whose sole job it is to fight for you. That would be incredible. You have been listening to my interview with Julie Lalonde about her Outside of the Shadows project. You can learn more about her work in general at yellowmanteau.com and more about this project at outsideoftheshadows.ca. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, or to suggest topics for future shows, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I'm your host, Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, Gender and Sexuality, and Resisting the State, both from Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.